Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words, and believe not, I judge him not, For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Amen. We are back. Um, Although if you have been are listening to this or are listening to this uh, a few years from now, you may not have realized we were gone. But yes, we've been on recess, if you will, for the past uh, about four months, even though we will be... Resuming exactly where we left off, there's nothing missing as far as uh, studies, the sermons, uh, the numbering of everything. And we will continue on uh, from where we were. And the reason that we stopped is to make uh, an adjustment in uh, how we function uh, and how we'll, more importantly, how we'll continue to function. That's really what it came down to. And so, although we've been gone for four months, it was hardly a vacation. It wasn't a vacation at all. I've worked harder in the last past four months than I probably have in the last uh, 40 years. But we've got everything done, uh, I think 90% done. And the only reason I say 90% is because as you accomplish something, you find other things that you want to get done on top of that as well as that. So that's where the other 10% come from. But we're back and we're going to be back now uh, from. Now on, uh, the only thing that can put us offline is either um, if I drop dead or the Lord decides he doesn't want us to do this anymore. Uh, It's no longer in the hands of people, and that was the point of it. I I don't misunderstand when when I say that, but we are entering a time, I believe, and I think even in the past four months, I'm absolutely amazed at the news anymore and how biblical prophecy, how things are just falling into place so fast. And seemingly just out of nowhere. I mean, we knew things were coming, but in a way that it just, it's just so simple and so easy and, and just there it is. And the world is just accepting it, just smoothly accepting things as they're happening. Uh, the rise of Europe now is, is a sure thing. There's nothing stopping them. What was stopping them previously was the, the U.S. occupation of Europe. Uh, Donald Trump has changed that. And it isn't just Donald Trump. I, I think a lot of people look at Donald Trump and say it's Trump, but it isn't. It's an, it's an attitude of the people of the U.S. And it amazes me as well. You know, you can ask someone in the U.S., is the U.S. an empire? And they will almost be offended uh, by the question. And, and yet the whole world views the U.S. as an empire. It, it isn't empires aren't just a bad thing necessarily, but there's something that eventually they always come to an end. And uh, sometimes, you know, most of them were, were so big that they were never militarily defeated. They just didn't want to do it anymore. And they wanted to just sort of, here's our country and just leave us alone, all you people that we once uh, influenced so much. And, you know, it, that can be a very good thing as well. I, I think here in Canada, I think Donald Trump is doing Canada a really big favor as a matter of, of just sort of go away, get lost, and, and make friends somewhere else and, and well at the same time being friends and it, it's it's made a very big difference just and again along comes Justin Trudeau who's in love with the world and the world sort of loves him and it's just the timing of it is absolutely amazing and but we're seeing now I think Herbert Armstrong said that the U.S. was going to become very 
isolationist, a very much a, an at-home country. And that's, you know, look around, that's happening. Not perhaps in the way Armstrong expected or in the way a lot of people expected. But it, it's something now that it, it is happening and it's undeniable to anyone who is willing to really look at things as they are. And as we know now from that point on, uh, what else is coming? The rise of Europe, the power again. Again, nothing new. The, the whole so-called Holy Roman Empire, the German nation, the same old players again, France and Germany rising. Uh, they were they were actually connected in a way that you might be surprised. But Charlemagne, that goes right back to him. Uh, and all the, the differences that are seemingly there now were really never differences at all. They were associated as a means of what was the Germanic and, and the connection between them is, is, is a matter of history and prophecy, it's the same thing. So as we're looking at all these things now, it's just, it's just amazing how, how, how much progress has been made in prophecy just in the past four months. I never expected to be where we are today four months ago when I, when I put Daily Bible Study on, on reset. And probably, maybe I wouldn't have done it then. Maybe, that, maybe that's a good thing as well because there was so much stuff happening. It was really tempting to just bring it back prior to the time uh, that I had set, which was September 2nd. And so, but I didn't because I knew, you know, we've got hands full to do this. But here we are and we're, we're ready to go and we're going to stay ready to go. Our first session, such as it was, you know, I've been at this 19 years or whatever, 20 years. And the sermons have been on not quite that long, but well enough. And, you know, we're, we're doing what we were given to do. I think the first, I, I look at it like the stages of a rocket. You know, the first stage has got us into orbit, if you will. And now, uh, the, the second stage is, is, is fired and, and getting us closer to where I think we need to be. And as far as a, a lot of the other things that are happening, playing church and all that, we've sort of grown out of that one because we are the church. You know, even, you know, even people who knew better or know better, and that still play church, you know, in the organization and the building and the corporation and all that, when they know full well that church is the people, and it always has been. And so we can look at that and say, look, here we are, and we know better, and a lot of people, you know, people, there were a lot of people upset when I took uh, the recess for the last, I call it that, the last four months. I sort of timed it in the, in the well, glad I timed it in the summer, because people understand uh, how that can be uh, done in the way that it's, a lot of people do that, a lot of organizations do that. But it's something a lot of people were upset with because they came to count on something, that the work that we do here. And But it also gave them an opportunity to go back and read some of the, and listen to the sermons. I mean, you could spend the last four months, I'm sure, listening to sermons and reading the work we've done and not be done. I'm sure of that. And very few people have read everything. So it's not as though the time is wasted for anyone either. And the number of new people, I gave them an opportunity to get up to speed again. I, I recommended that to people who wrote. You know, don't say that there's nothing to do because there sure is. You know, there's lots to do, lots to read, lots to study. And the, the prime focus, the number one thing that I recommend is read the Bible. And again, it still amazes me how many people haven't yet. But a number of people have begun, many people have begun reading it using our one-year Bible plan, and that's good. And it introduces them to daily Bible study, which is about the Bible. And I can find, really, in that, a new, I won't say a new generation, but an end-time attitude uh, that I think is going to be necessary. Whereas prior to that time, I, ages of the church, that, that that's real. That is real, I'm certain of it. And the seven churches of Asia, how that was used successively. And even though they were contemporary, they were not successful in the sense that there was a uh, just a church here of, of this church, and then it moved on to the next era. I think the Armstrong Church, I guess I shouldn't say that, should I? But I will anyway. Believe that very much, and, and the end time Laodicean and all the rest of it. But, you know, those people all existed, those attitudes existed from very much throughout time together, they, they existed by the very object lesson of his describing it. They were in fact there, and I'm his, when I say him, that was Jesus Christ describing it. They existed at the same time then, and just as they do now. 
but I think they also have a successive application as well and, and manifestation as well over time because the, I think the Armstrong way of doing things, it had its era. It was very big for a while, not a long time as a matter of when you compare it to history, but it's gone now. I mean, the attitude is still there in the minds of a lot of people and how to do things, but that the organization doesn't exist anymore, even by name. Uh, there are many successive uh, offshoots that came out of it, but those people who did that, uh, many of them have passed on. They live to be like 80 and 90 years old. They're gone. And you watch what's going to happen with the next generation of that. It's, they they don't have it. They don't have the experience or the ability. Look what happened to the original Worldwide Church of God when it passed in the Takash regime. The father, uh, I don't think he was really there to begin with, for getting into all that. But the son really wasn't. I mean, look what he did. Uh, the father put it into a slow descent. The, the son put it into a no side. And he, he really slammed it into the ground. And the bulldozers in there now, what, all that was there. And the attitude, you know, it, it's just different. It doesn't exist anymore. Whereas the Bible continues on. And a lot of things that, that they had right, and they surely did, don't exist anymore. It's a matter of the, of the object lessons that they were looking to in order to prove the points that they understood. Those object lessons have never changed, but they, the, the attitude or the view of them um, is now looking at something else. But in Europe, they had that right, absolutely. The isolationism of the U.S., absolutely, dead on right. And it, it's happening, really. I mean, sometimes, you know, the old saying, forest for the trees, can't see the forest for people. Well, it's probably true in a lot of cases, and sometimes if you're not standing in the forest, uh, you can see more. You can see not only the entire forest, but you can see what's around it and what's coming around it and what's what's happening. And whereas if you are just really into the forest, the little meanings of that, then it doesn't matter. You don't really care anyway. But it's coming and there's nothing that can stop it. I, prophecy, I think we, in the past four months, I think the world has made like 20 years of progress in four months toward the end time setting of the stage and it's there it's there right now all all that begins that could begin it right now is the pope to begin his miracles and that's up to satan when he's going to be allowed to do it it's up to the lord but it, it's up to satan when as soon as he has the ability to do it i don't think he's going to wait you know he knows his time is short as well that you could wake up one morning turn on your news however you read news now and find the pope has begun miracles and, of course, the political attraction of the rise of the beast power in Europe, who that will be, might be, a, I think, a big surprise there as well. But the, the next generation of that uh, coming up, uh, it's it's there, and it could happen really fast now, because everything else is there, everything. And it's not as though, again, the U.S. going home, and more or less, and it is, you know, the United States can pretty much exist on its own in the world. It doesn't need the world. You know, it has the an economy that is massive. It has all the, the ideas of, of we are big enough to really live in our own space, and that's fine. And really the reason, the only reason now that the U.S. is still very much a part of the world is the military spending. You have to justify it. You know, we see aircraft carrier battle groups on, I love it when they say routine patrol. I love that term just because it means something very different to, depending on which side of the patrol you're on. But it, it's like, you know, Captain Kirk out there in the Starship Enterprise patrolling the universe. And, you know, it's, it's just something so, so much of, of obvious and yet so depending on what you're seeing is which side of the, of it you're looking at. But it's happening. It doesn't matter how you look at it or who realizes it or not. It's there. And it would take now uh, from, it would take World War II again to restore what Europe, the U.S. control of Europe. And Russia doesn't really care either. A lot of Russia is viewed as the boogeyman, apart from the whether what was going on with the election of Donald Trump. It's, it's, that's a separate issue. But, you know, Russia has been viewed or accused of being the, the boogeyman, the great threat to Europe all these years. But you know, Russia was attacked by Europe. I'll put the link on from the state of the world. They were just like they were attacked by Napoleon the century before that. You know, the, what Russia did 
in invading Europe was not an invasion, it was a counterattack to drive Nazi German troops back to Germany, out of Russia and back to Germany. And the building up of the, the Soviet Union, those buffer states, Poland all across in there, and that's exactly was what it was. It was like a buffer zone to prevent a, another invasion by Europe. So even they, you know, they'd be quite happy if Europe wasn't a threat. And I'm sure they'd be quite happy not to be there. But there it is again. And it's it's going to happen again. But it's not something that is either new or old. It's just something that's there. And we can read of it. In, in I'm glad now that we did take our time. The beleaguering it. But it, we're ready now. We're really ready now. And that was the point of taking our little recess. And as we go along now, you're going to see more and more. I mean, if we make the progress, if the world quote unquote, makes the world makes the progress that it has in the world uh, at the rate it has in the past four months, I mean, wow, we're going to get past the finish line. I mean, it's going to have to slow down a little bit uh, and just in order to let everything catch up. That's how fast it's moving. But it's it's amazing how it is. And how, again, Donald Trump, everybody says, well, Trump, Trump, Trump. But, you know, Trump didn't elect himself. Donald Trump did not elect himself. He was elected. And it was an attitude not only of of a particular p- political party, but a, a view of the world. And, you know, that's it, the British Empire did the same thing. And they are now, you know, Britain is still there. They're not an empire anymore. But you can notice they have that same view of the world that they wish, you know, why don't you just leave us alone? But they can't because they were very much a part of bringing all those people, times the Gentiles, if you want to use that term, into themselves, and they couldn't undo it again after that. And the same thing in the U.S. But it's, Europe is, is experiencing it, but that we know from prophecy what's going to happen there. The King of North, King of the South, Prophet Daniel saw it, Apostle John saw it in Revelation, same thing, Roman Catholicism versus, versus Mohammedanism, again, the, the, with the meat uh, that they're fighting over, uh, being Jerusalem as the capital of their, their religions. They don't care about the politics of it. It always comes down to religion. And it's there again. And again, the rise of ISIS, how they want to restore the caliphate and all of that, just exactly as, as existed uh, by the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was one of the longest empires that ever existed, 400 years or more, fell just at the end of the First World War, uh, just the very time Britain, the British mandate uh, took uh, everything from Egypt to, or were given, handed in fact, everything from Egypt to Afghanistan. Uh, it enabled the people of Judah to get a foothold in the modern state of Israel, which is actually Judah. They almost, David Ben Gurion actually almost said it um, in, in his declaration of the state of Israel. He almost said it. Uh, I'm, he was thinking it, I'm sure, but he, he was also perhaps looking at the view of the, the lost ten tribes coming home, he's aware of those. So Israel and calling it that, so he actually went one step greater or above. But there we are, and, and it's something, you know, there is so much that we could cover, but which we have covered. And again, the reason I said why, you know, read, read what's already there. And it's happening. You know, whether we're right or not is irrelevant to the fact that read what we've written based on prophecy. It isn't about the writings of a man saying C, C, C. It's about prophecies and saying C, C, C. Because you can look in the news and see it. And there it is. And you're going to see a lot more of it. It's, it's accelerating, as I said, just amazing and fast. Amazing. So we continue. Where we left off four months ago as though um, we didn't. Today is sermon number 697. Previous one was 696. Today's sermon 257 in our ongoing complete reading of the Holy Bible. And where John was, actually where we stopped, was actually also a good part because the place we were going to, simply because what was done there by John, what was recorded by John, seen by John, was different in that from the other apostles, and it was written in, in a perspective. John lived to be the oldest of of them, simply because he wasn't killed as a young man as the rest of them were. And he saw something that the others did not. And from their perspective, I, I think really that's the reason there was a difference 
in how they recorded what they did. Because John's perspective was longer. I won't say deeper, but I would say longer because he saw a lot more by virtue of the fact that he lived to be, you know, 50 years longer. He lived to be around 80 years old. And he was able to see things by virtue of the application of prophecy in his time. How he saw the Roman Empire doing what it was doing. How the decay had set in by that time as well. Well beyond Nero and the rest. It was something that even then, it was turning in on itself. They had to have concentration camps on islands, you know, which is where John was, Patmos. And he was looking at something then, if you had to resort to the people that they once had as a matter of their hearts and minds, they didn't have to imprison them. But later on, the politics of it, they had to do it. And again, the familiarity of that. And that's what we're seeing with John. As we're reading John's Gospel here, as it's called, that of course hadn't begun yet. But later on, the epistles that he wrote, and then the, then the book of Revelation, or Apocalypse, which means revealing, again, you can see, and I think it's the reason, the difference of the tone of the apostles, his, his Gospel book, and the, the later epistles, and as well as the book of Revelation, because it's an epistle too. It's a letter to seven churches. Not written by John, but written by the Messiah. So, beginning today then, John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And Bethany was a, a very important part or point in the life of the Messiah. His ascension to heaven was from near Bethany, up at the link on for those studies. Uh, Mary and Martha, uh, very famous. Mary uh, was actually the is the actually the Roman version of the actual Hebrew name Miriam, which was there. And the mother of, of the Messiah uh, had the same Hebrew name as um, Moses' sister, for example, Miriam. And even in the Hebrew, it was pronounced slightly different. But it's a Romanized or Latinized. Uh, there's a Greek connection in that as well. Uh, version of those people's actual names. It's sort of ironic, but a lot of people in the Bible, the most famous people in the Bible, would not recognize the names that we today view them as so very famous. David was David. Uh, even Jerusalem place names, just totally nothing like they were originally spoken. Uh, Jerusalem is Yerushalayim. Uh, Israel is Yisrael. Uh, the, the, many of the vowels do not exist in the same cross languages. The reason the pronunciation, as well as the reason the accents happen across languages from people, but it was somewhere that they were actually the, the really the closest friends in that area. Uh, Martha and Mary actually more than Lazarus actually, actually, and Lazarus was about to, to be a very major object lesson, considering I'll put link on for that study that his own. Death was in itself an object lesson of the coming resurrection of the Messiah. It happened not long, not long previous to that time, and of course they wanted to the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious council, they wanted to kill Lazarus again because there he was proof of what was actually going to happen. Thank God for that. So his own life was threatened. And, you know, considering the irony of that, that you know he'd been risen from the dead, and and imagine it, how deeply into themselves these people were and no different ancient from ancient times to the present, in that they saw the miracles, and instead of being just joyous, absolutely giddy joyous, knowing, well, the dead can be raised, so that means all our family members, our loved ones, um, maybe children that have died by accidents or sickness or whatever, will live again. But what did they do? Well, they decided to kill the one that made it possible. I mean, really think about that. But it's no different than, than today. It's the same old old story. Um, you know the old saying, rock and roll is a, is a vicious game? Well, I think the people who believe that uh, have never tried to preach what's in this book because it's, it's amazing the responses. And oftentimes the most supposedly Christian people become so deeply offended at what the Word of God actually says. But again, we all know the reason for that, and we all know what the cure for that is. That is coming for everyone, everyone. 
And I used to think that there was going to be a relatively small number of people in Lake of Fire, but I, I've begun to wonder about that. Because I think there are a lot of people who who do know better and have the means of knowing better by means of the Holy Spirit, and they're still clinging to things that they should have that should have been washed off or were actually washed off by the Holy Spirit and they chose to go back and roll it in, in it again, you know. And the Bible is very has some pretty earthy language, you know, a dog returns to his vomit and a pig a washed pig, you know, you can wash a pig off, but they'll go right back and wallow in the mire again. You know, very plain speaking, that's what it was talking about. And you know, some of the things that are said I, I think Everyone is going to have the freedom to choose, and I think a lot more people than maybe we originally thought are going to choose not to accept the Messiah's offer of life. But again, that's up to them. It's their choice. It literally is. Verse 2, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And again, I'll put the link on for those names. Uh, Lazarus was the Latinized version of Eleazar. Uh, again, very Hebrew name. Verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the, God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. And again, it was an object lesson. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now think about that. He should have rushed there, they thought, a lot of people think, and did whatever he needed to do. But he had something bigger in mind, and something more, a greater healing. He could have healed him simply from whatever else, do you think maybe that when Lazarus was risen from the dead, he was obviously healed of whatever he died from, but do you suppose that he was healed of a lot of other things too? And he come out of that tomb, the physical resurrection, uh, why would it leave, you know, something that's healed somebody from the dead, probably fixed a few other things, and no one is, there's no such thing as perfect health, everyone has, has things, things to deal with, some serious, some not so serious, some painful, not some not as painful, um, but everybody has that sort of baggage. Now, but can you imagine if he came out of the tomb, having just been cured of death, but cured of whatever killed him? Probably a lot of other things. He probably came out of there with pretty healthy. But of course, they wanted to kill him later on. But not long after, verse seven. Then, after that, saith he to his disciples, "Let us go into Judea again." His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? And of course the way that's translated, the Jews. But really what it's saying is those, those Jews, because they were Jews as well. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, it was the, the, those who yet had not reached the point of awakening. You know, there was a, a, a young Pharisee named Saul there, one of the most vicious thugs. Uh, there was in town. He was young. He was, he was sort of the young gunner for the older guys, the older Pharisees. And I think personally, I've said this a number of times, I, people don't just get off like that and have, take it so personal that they would become a Christian hunter uh, without having been given a public embarrassment. I think he was indeed one of those. We know that he a number of times rebuked and embarrassed the Pharisees. We know Saul later known as the Apostle Paul, was a Jerusalem Pharisee. He was there. There's no doubt about that. That's what the Bible says. So he was among them. And as a younger man, he probably couldn't handle the criticism as well as the older guys. Uh, not because the older guys like it. This, this is a lesson you learn later on. Right? If you happen to be older, you realize you don't like it any anymore or even can tolerate it anymore, but you realize that retaliating just makes it, it worse. And causes more stuff to be thrown back at you. So what's the point? And if they're not listening anyway, why bother? You know, what's the point? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. 
But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. So he didn't have to go there to know that Lazarus was dead or about to die. He knew it. Verse 12 then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he will do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. And you know, consider the difference of rest in peace. All the terminology has been used and why death is referred to as sleep. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I say. I put the link on for the studies. And the reason for it, you know, we sort of experience death and resurrection every 24 hours. You sleep at night, you go to sleep, you get up in the morning, uh, bright new light and all of those things that, that are directly in themselves object lessons. We don't think of it that way, but that's really what it is. Verse 14, then said Jesus unto them, plainly, Lazarus is dead. And what he would have said is, Eleazar is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto them. And again, you see the object lesson. It was for the, for the believers. It didn't do any good whatsoever to the unbelievers. They were not about to believe. Everything to them was fake news, to use the modern day term. It doesn't matter how much proof they have, how much reason there is to them. They were just not, period, going to believe it. Verse 16 then said, Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us, go all, let us also go that we may die with him. And there's pretty big bravado there, but we know in the end, uh, when it really came down to it, they all ran, except John. John may have had an advantage in that, in that he would have also had to run not only from Jesus, but from his, his own mother, to leave his own mother there, because she was there, along with her sister Mary or Miriam, uh, and Mary of Magdala uh, were there. That's only God for that. Verse 17, then, when Jesus came, he found that he had been had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Mary unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, Whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, that God will give it thee. And again, isn't that a statement of faith and a statement of reality? And again, the statement of the power of the rising, what was, would in fact raise the Messiah himself in due time. Verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother will rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And the understanding that she had there. Isn't that amazing? Jesus saith, said unto her, I am this resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So again, same thing, same statement. So obviously they were saying it. 
prior to that time, but he's thinking it. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And that is uh, often referred to as the shortest verse of the Bible, but keep in mind there were no verses as it was originally written. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. You notice they're exactly the same sort of burial uh, that would happen. The difference, of course, is that Lazarus was going to be resurrected physically. He would have died again. That's the reason they wanted to kill him again. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And again, that's an interesting point in that he, did he pray simply by thinking? Did he, did Jesus pray out loud? What would be the need of that, do you think? And again, is, that a, is there a lesson in that? It's something that normally when we pray, most people, they pray speaking, even when they're praying alone. But is that necessary? It's because Jesus apparently didn't. He prayed publicly in this particular case, but he just explained why. Interesting point there. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. And again, you notice they were the Jews. But you notice there was the believing Jews, and those who didn't yet believe, and probably some who never would, just the same as there are our people of all religions, even the, even the Christian one can use that. Same thing. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So again, they went tittle-tattle uh, to tell the Pharisees for whatever reason. Birds of a feather flock together, as the old saying goes. Verse 47, Then gathered the chief priests, and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. And stop, ooh, there's a, isn't that a confession? An admission. They knew full well that he was doing miracles. But what, look at the reasoning. Verse 48, If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Isn't that pathetic? Absolutely pathetic. They were saving themselves for this world and the lessons about that. What gain? What do you do? What have you gained if you gain everything in this world, all political power and religious esteem, high and mightiness up on the little pedestal, but lose your very life, your very eternal life? And this is what they're playing with right here. Very serious matter. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Now what did he mean by that? Was he, were we talking about a savior? Well, no. But apparently at that very time, Barabbas is a prime example, there was an insurrection going on, because they were an occupied country, Judea. There were a lot of the, 
the boot kissers, uh, who look to the foreign Caesar as, you know, the, we have no king but Caesar, and they were very much a part of the occupation in the sense that uh, their occupations became a product of the occupation. They were not patriotic people, whereas some of them were. Barabbas, I'll put the link on for him, uh, I think he's one of the most misunderstood people in the Bible. Keeping in mind that Barabbas was the one that was supposed to be crucified in that center cross that day, uh, but he was released, and Jesus of Nazareth took his place. Uh, but there was some stuff going on at that time, some violence. And so what this they were saying here, well, let's just put it all onto this guy. He can be the leader uh, of all the stirring up that's going on, uh, the insurrection that's going on. They captured a few, obviously, Barabbas among them. Let's just lay it all on this guy, and then they can execute him, and then we can all just get on over it. You, and consider what he was saying, because that is what he was saying. And thus, he's not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. You know, it's again, it's a duality there. He was saying things he didn't fully understand, but he was saying right at the bottom line of it for his own reasons, for his own political reasons, all the rest of it. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. And that's the lost ten tribes. We thank God for that. And he's going to, by the way, on the day of his return, the reunification of Israel is going to happen. And those who believe in, the, by the way, the, the Anglo-Israelism thing, consider the full implications of that. If you think you're Israel, well, then you're not of the country that you think you're in now. And when you're gathered, you're going to go back to where you came from. And you know, think about that. Wonder how many can handle that. Verse 53 then, then from that day forth they took counsel together or to put him to death. Now again, absolutely pathetic. Uh, they just seen the miracle, the rising from the dead. Even the rising from the dead should have itself shown to them or made them realize just how futile, how futile killing him was because he, he's going to be back one way or the other, far greater than they, they realized. But there they go. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence to a country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And Ephraim was up in the central area of the Samaritan region. Uh, to the south was, was Judea. Uh, in the central area, the Samaritans had, had been given uh, the land by the, the Assyrians when they took away uh, the, the lost ten tribes. Ephraim was sort of actually the capital region of the northern ten tribes, the northern kingdom of Israel, one well, of the, the kings of Israel, the divided kingdom of Israel, uh, are buried in that area across there. Um, Joshua was buried across there, in there. Um, but at that time, it was the Samaritans. They'd been there for a long time. So he went to the, the towns of the Samaritans, which people in Judea, they, they recognized uh, that their kingdom was the kingdom of Judah. They made no bones about that, no pun intended. But they, but at that time it was always it was Samaritan anyway, and even farther north, uh, even then the the Syrian connection beyond that, and it would inappropriately so because Jesus' primary language was Aramean or Aramaic, uh, which is not Arabic. I'll put the link on for that. When he prayed, he prayed to the Father in in the Syrian language, Abba's Father. The Eli Eli Labak Sabak is Syrian. Aramaic, uh, Rabboni, they called him Rabboni, which is a Syrian word, uh, not Hebrew. Hebrews, Rabbi. John, ironically, they, they, call, they would have called in the actual languages, they would have called Jesus Rabboni by the Aramaic word, whereas John the Baptist, they called him Rabbi, and that's that's direct, because John was was from the south. Uh, he was of the uh, a Levite, where all the Levites had gone into the south um, after the Division of Israel, uh, into Israel and Judah, uh, Jeroboam the first, he created his own state religion, drove out all the, the faithful Levites, and they all went down to Judah. And so Judah, the tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, uh, became the kingdom of Judah, just as they are today. And the northern, there are no faithful Levites, at least in terms of ancestry, in the lost ten tribes. That may surprise some people who think they are. 
I think there's a sort of a quasi Christian religion if you think they are Levites. I think they're into the Anglo Israelism thing too, but I think they're the ones that believe that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri or someplace. Is that the one? And that Jesus is going to return uh, to Missouri and, and rule the world as a second command to, uh, well, whatever. It gets a little silly. It's not silly to them, but it's. <laughs> Verse 55, And the Jews' Passover was high at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And again, you can, it, it, that puts a time stamp uh, on when Lazarus' resurrection happened. And again, it was for a purpose, as we'll read. Verse 56, And then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should give shew it, he should shew it, that they might take him. And of course they did. And the one that actually did that, fulfilled that, uh, for 30 pieces of silver, silver was Judas of Iscariot. John 12, and as we read earlier, this was a lead up to... Um, the time of the Passover, and why, again, it's important to read the Bible in its entirety. Many people will think, well, in order to understand a verse, I should read the entire chapter, and that's a good good thing to do. But sometimes, in order to understand a chapter, you need to read more than that. Because, keeping in mind, there were no chapters or verses uh, in the original scriptures. Actually, chapters and verses were, were created about 200 years apart. So, I mean, it's, it's good. I don't think it takes anything away from the Bible. It probably adds a whole lot because it's it's a crutch in the sense that we are able to find things much more quickly than back in the time. You know, and you notice that when Jesus stood up to read in, in the temple that day, he was handed the scroll and he found the place in Isaiah. And there were no chapters and verses for him to do that. He knew exactly where he was going. And they all had to back then. John 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So there's Lazarus all back from the dead. Probably very healthy. I, I really think it, it's not stated, but I mean, if you're going to be raised from the dead, why just cure the part that killed him? Uh, is probably an infection or something, um, whatever. Back then, there were no antibiotics. Something, uh, you know, a simple little thing could could kill you. Um, apart from injuries, that's another matter. But illnesses, you know, they just didn't. I, I really do think that they they had much stronger immune systems than the modern day era, uh, in the sense that you either you developed your own immunity to something or you died. It was that really that simple. And keeping in mind inoculations and antibiotics are something, the product of the last few decades, really, uh, not prior to that time. A lot of controversies about whether it causes autism or all sorts of other problems. Uh, but again, you know, people, for example, with autism, they've been around walk longer than, than uh, inoculations. Whether well, there's something else to do, I don't know. Whatever. Verse 3 then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now, did she benefit a little bit herself there with that ointment? She, she must, must have if she dried her, with her feet. Not taking away from what she did, but she she smelled pretty pretty too. Didn't she? Verse 4 then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him? Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And I have here in my notes uh, in the Bible footnote, that's $132. That's what it says here. How they arrived at that. Um, but, you know, expensive. It wouldn't have been a millionaire's, only within millionaire's reach, but it was expensive. I mean, $132. $132 perfume that someone just poured out. So there was Judas of Iscariot um, complaining about it. 
Why? Verse 6, This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me have ye not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. And again, uh, the object lesson that was there. Lazarus was actually more famous at that point uh, than the Messiah was. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death also. Again, isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. Here, the, here was a man that they knew had been raised from the dead. They admitted it as we read in the earlier chapter, but what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. I mean, just think how absolutely obtuse that is, that state of mind is. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. One of the most famous incidents of the Bible, events. I'll put the link on for Hosanna, what that means. Verse 14, And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered that they, that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. Now again, the object lesson there. Donkeys, or asses, mules, uh, were beasts of burden. They carried the load for other people. And that's what the Messiah was about to do. They were humble animals. People make fun of them. Uh, but the fact is they were very useful, noble animals. And if you had a mule or an ass or donkey, you took well care of it because it took well care of you. And again, the object lesson there is that when the Messiah returns, it is not going to be on a donkey. It's going to be on a horse. And horse, horses traditionally have been animals of war. Uh, cavalry uh, rode them. Uh, chariots rode them. I mean, when was the last time you saw a chariot uh, being pulled by a mule or a cavalry charging into battle on a mule? Uh, I suppose it's happened, but it's not what was traditionally thought of because it traditionally never happened. There are two different, two different ideas. Horses, of course, have been used uh, as beasts of burden as well. There's work horses and there's there's riding horses and all that, but they're traditionally they're, they're two very different purposes. Verse 17, The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from, from the dead, bear record. So again, they were witnesses of the resurrection of Lazarus. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how? He prevailed nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. So what a pathetic bunch of people they were, but unfortunately. We know some of them repented. Uh, Saul did. Uh, Nicodemus, by that time, had repented. He was a Pharisee. He was given the very famous John 3.16 and, and born-again teachings. Uh, he was a Pharisee. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship. At the feast, the same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or wheat fall, Unto the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And again, the lesson, think about that. 
Seeds are good things, but seed is not the point of the seed. The seed is to create life in its due time. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now this, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And again, watch the lesson. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spoke to him again, why he prayed in public. It wasn't for the purpose of the Father hearing him, but again, so that the people could hear the Father's response. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Again, the very plain. Did Jesus pray by speaking, or did he pray in spirit, by thinking? He did both, but what was the point of the prayer? And again, the privacy of prayer. And the purpose of public prayer, again, both are acceptable uh, depending on what is being done. Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he would die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Again, a lot of that going on, wasn't there? And it wouldn't be any different today. It's exactly the same thing. The Word of God is actually in itself a miracle. Um, people have their own way of doing things. In too many cases yet. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. And again, the purpose of that, the two resurrections, put the link on for that. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And again, the Jews, while well, there were believing Jews and there were unbelieving Jews, and there were those who were more courageous than others, saying, I believe, and that's the way that is, and you can think whatever you like about it. They were really risking their own lives and doing that, but they did it because they understood that their life was far greater in purpose and whatever, you know, if the worst someone can do is kill you physically, then they don't really have much power at all. And the Bible itself speaks of that. Verse 43, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. And again, I'll put the link on for what the Father looks like. That's going to be a surprise too, I think. Verse 46, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And by that I mean, what would, what would, uh, for example, the Father, would it be really shocking if he were a man 30 years old, appeared that way? Do you think that would be, why would he be old? 
uh, when he's not aging, when he's eternal? I mean, did he spend like the first eternity as an infant, and then the next eternity uh, as a as a teenager, and then the next eternity as a as a young man? Now, the, in this eternity, and of course that's a paradox, isn't there? There's, there's only one eternity, forever is forever. There's no reason for him to look old or young. Verse 48, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And again, the reason why the Messiah is known as the Word of God. Continuing verse 50, And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this, God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee.